So hello, everybody. Thank you very much for coming, um, both to this conference and to this talk. I know it's the last talk, last talk of the day. Um, so thanks for st uh, um, staying long enough and, and coming to this talk. Um, what I'm going to talk about is test automation without assertions. And this is also a project on GitHub. And my um, goal for today, um, for this talk, is to have you um, like the approach and like the project so much that you go all the way uh, to give us a GitHub star. So um, that for you, if you have a GitHub account, is not very much to do. It's like a click for you. Um, but for us, uh, for our project, it means very lot. Um, so I hope that I can uh, get you to the point where you like it and say, OK, at least I give it a GitHub star. And if you do that, I have a couple of um, stickers here that I want to share with you. So um, afterwards, I'll, I'll just spread them, and, and uh, you can grab some of them. Um, so. Um, Maybe you know the problem in general. Um, if you have a test that checks something, and although what you check, although what you check um, is fulfilled, but the test um, does not quite capture the intent, like it does not um, capture what you really want to see, um, then this uh, talk is for you. And the first thing I want to start with is a short demo. So um, can everybody see this? OK, so this is a very short um, Selenium test. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Selenium, it's, it's um, explicitly short and explicitly simple, such that it works um, for, uh, sorry, for um, um, conference talk. And if I execute it, you will see that all it does is it opens a page, um, it enters username, password, Clicks on success, uh, clicks on login, and then checks whether um, the the message success was displayed on the follow-up page. So, in order to check whether the login was successful, it's a very simple test. And um, I have the um, HTML here that um, makes up the page that is being tested. And if I now change something, uh, let's say um, I remove uh, uh, just one character from the from the declaration of the CSS, then what you will see is that the website is actually broken because there's no CSS anymore. It's, it's rendered from, from a user's perspective. It's broken. But because all I check is whether uh, success is being displayed, um, the test still passes, right? So this is clearly not what I want. And on the other hand, if I change something as insignificant as an ID, and now going back to the test, um, it identifies or it, it, um, kept, it, it um, identifies the elements it wants to inter interact with by the ID. So if I change the ID now, if I execute the test, obviously it's broken, so it can't work on it anymore. And because it can't identify the elements anymore it wants to interact with, although um, that what I changed, the ID, is insignificant for the user. So the user who's using your website doesn't care what IDs your elements have, yet the test does. And we think that this is um, the opposite of what we want to see. So instead, um, you could uh, use recheck, um, which I'm going to uh, show you. And you just grab your driver, um, your, your Chrome driver or what have you, in the recheck driver. And then if you execute the same test, and um, you remove um, or change the CSS declaration. As you can see, the website is again broken because I removed the CSS. But this time, um, it's being detected. And it says that it has 116 differences that are unintended. And the test fails. So this is what you want to see. And even better, if you now change or remove the ID and execute the test, Guess what? It still works. So it can identify the ID um, and execute the test and the screen. So this is what we want to see, what we would like to have with the Selenium or with, with, with any test of a user interface. And I'm now going to show, show you and explain you, to you um, how this works under the hood and um, how you can use it. So, oh, sorry. So the idea generally is that we, want, that we do one thing differently. Um, instead, so with a typical test, um, you define the outcome. 
So you, you, you write an assert where you say what you want to see, and instead, with that type of test, you approve the outcome. So you, so you manually test once, and then you capture that, what, what you manually tested and verified that it's correct within your testing framework, and your testing framework just makes sure that it doesn't change um, unexpectedly, that you don't have unintended side effects, regressions. And in that regard, we argue that automated tests are not tests. Because with a, with a manual test, when you execute a manual test, what you try to find is a bug. At the, at the, at the, at the second you execute the test, you try to improve the, um, the quality of your project. But with an automated test, what you do is you expect that it passes. So um, all the automated test does is it guards you against unintended changes, against regressions. So in that regard, an automated test is more like version control than a typical test. And typical version control, like if you use good in Git in your project, it answers the question, where has the code changed? But what you rather would have is, the problem is that the code is not the software. Software is more than code. Software is what you get when you execute the code and you put, in, uh, put it into a runtime system, you put in some data, so you put in some configuration. Um, so what you see on the screen, the, the, the experience that the user has is more than the code. So uh, using version control to capture and govern the code fails short of governing the user experience. And what we really want to know is where has the software changed? So right now, we close the gap using automated tests. And in, in that view, in, you know, using that notion that I just explained, means that an automated test is a means to turn um, the dynamic runtime behavior of your software into a static artifact then, uh, that then can be governed by version control, and you execute the test um, to, to um, compare the expected um, runtime behavior of the software with the actual runtime behavior of the software. So, if automated tests are version control, um, then I have an example for you um, that's using a different project, different open, open source project, and that works um, on, on the unit level, or not on the unit level, on the interface uh, level. So in that, um, in that example, um, you want some XML to be transformed, and you have a uh, remove element transformer that should remove a uh, remove tag out of the XML, and um, what you do is, in your test with the assertions, you just check that the remove tag has been removed, so it's no longer contained, and that the keep tag is still within the XML, so it's not removed. So what you want to see is that if you um, input the above XML, then what uh, result should be like is the, the below XML, right? This is what you want to test. However, the way you assert um, that behavior, um, if that is the result of your of your transformation, the test still passes. So that's an, an example like before, um, where the assertion falls short of capturing uh, the essence of what you want to what you want to what you want to see. So here again, as you can see, the keep tag is still there. It's not even valid XML anymore, right? But the keep tag is is there, and the remove tag is not. So this test will pass. And um, on that level, <clears throat> sorry, on that level, um, um, what you can do is a golden master testing. So it's something that's been invented uh, in the 80s, so it's, it's a known technique. Um, it's something that is uh, usually applied to legacy systems. If you have a large uh, code base uh, of legacy code that you can't govern anymore, then what you do is uh, you go for the input-output and just ensure that the output doesn't change unintentionally. And this is golden master testing. And um, so this is uh, approval tests, and this works for, for Java projects or Java code, um, and you can just verify that the result is what you expect. So the first time you execute the test, it will fail, but it will create the golden master, and the next time you execute the test, it will compare um, the exact uh, output that was generated um, to the output that was approved before, and it will show if as much as one single character changes. So it will only pass if the result looks like that. However, 
using such a technique, uh, golden master approach, um, you usually have two challenges. One is noise and the other is redundancy. And I'll come to each one of that in a minute. I'll start with noise. Um, so what do we mean by noise? Or how can you, can you address the issue? Well, if you have noise, for instance, in an audio signal, what you do is um, you apply a filter, right? And when we can do the same here. But um, coming back to our original notion of uh, testing not being, uh, or automated testing not being testing, actually, but being a version control, then um, what, what, what noise is, um, um, is suddenly something different. So if you have um, an assert statement, then what that assert, uh, assert statement does is it creates a rule in a deny list of changes. Like if, if a testing is version control, then the assert statement says, okay, this property, um, this uh, whatever it is, does, may not change without me being noticed. So if that change, the test has to fail, and I will be noticed, uh, notified, um, and then I can either update the test or I can fix whatever is broken. On the other hand, uh, on version control, we have the notion of a git ignore, which means that um, if you have too much, um, if you have like class files, artifact, log, uh, log files, stuff like that, um, you ignore them using a git ignore file uh, to remove the noise. So uh, in the git ignore file, everything that you're not interested in, you just uh, specify and it's been ignored. And this um, creates a spectrum, right? And uh, the ideal amount of checks that you want to have in your typical test is somewhere in between. So on the one hand side, if you don't specify any assertions, then you check nothing, right? If your deny list is empty, you check nothing. On the other hand side, if you um, don't specify anything in your git ignore file, for instance, um, then you check everything. So not as much as a single character may change without you being noticed. But what you want in a typical environment is something in between, right? You, want, uh, you don't want to be notified about every change because you have things that you don't care about, but um, about, you want to be notified about things that you do care about. And interesting enough, um, it makes it different from which side you approach the problem. Um, so at Google, they have um, this interesting um, mechanism where they notify manual testers. So if you're a manual tester at Google, um, then you should, take, uh, you should uh, watch out for those uh, unicorns or the, the, the dancing ponies on the screen because those uh, mark changed functionality. So if you're a tester, you want to test uh, very um, scrutin you want to scrutinize um, the elements that are marked with such a unicorn. However, at some point, somebody forgot to remove that marker before pushing to production. So suddenly, the customers had dancing unicorns on their screen. Because um, also, nobody uh, thought about uh, writing a test for that. So, because nobody expected, you know, dancing unicorns on the screen. Um, which means that if you, essentially, you can't write an assertion for something that you don't expect, right? If, if, if you don't uh, know that this could eventually happen, you don't guard against it. However, um, if you are notified about every unexpected change, then you get notified about the dancing con uh, unicorns on the screen because they are unexpected. So you get notified about them. Um, and this is the reason, like I didn't, I didn't want to call that blacklist, whitelist, um, but um, if you do, for instance, um, a firewall, if you create a firewall, then you don't close individual ports, you close all the ports at once and you do a whitelist of ports that you want to allow, right? And this is the same principle for obvious reasons. And the other thing um, that um, kind of makes sense is that most of the time you want to check more rather than less. So typically, the amount of checks that you want to want to um, put into into your tests are um, more. So you don't you don't want to put assertions for each and everything. Um, you rather want to ignore those five I don't know elements or attributes that you don't care about. This is the reason why we call our approach also Git for the GUI because um, it's essentially um, what, what we do. Git is our role model in that regard. And therefore, um, like Git has a Git ignore file and we created a recheck ignore file. 
So you can put that recheck ignore file either into your project or into your um, personal um, um, folder, like uh, your user folder, uh, under beneath uh, .retest. And then retest will pick it up. So um, you can, for instance, ignore um, attributes on a global level. So you can ignore the glass attribute. Um, or you can uh, specify rec access. So you can say everything that starts with data, I want to ignore. So that regex specifically uh, ignores everything, <laughs> which is, again, not what you want to do. Um, then you can ignore specific elements. So you can say, I don't care about links, or I don't care about iframes, or I don't care about you know, specific um, elements within your DOM. Um, and you can identify um, individual elements by um, identifying attributes, like by their ID, by their um, class, by their XPath, so you could just, and then you can combine that. So you can say, okay, uh, for the element with the ID uh, diff whatever, um, I want to ignore the font. Um, or I want to um, ignore whole subtrees. Maybe um, I just um, specify, I, I um, don't care about whatever I have, um, um, changing animation on my website or a subtree that, that's uh, coming from, from a different component, uh, from a different uh, microservice, whatever. So I want to ignore that completely. So in such a way, um, ignore um, is like a filter. Um, wh what I said earlier, to ignore the noise, uh, you can ignore a filter um, or such ignore file uh, to reduce the noise in, in the changes that you're notified about. And I just want to give you a short uh, demo again. Um, so if you, uh, right, if you have a website like that. So these two websites, as you can see, are very different from one another. So they, have, they differ in uh, color, in font, in, in the outline, like where the elements are uh, placed. Um, they differ on, on very much. And using um, the GUI, um, but you can do the same with the CLI, um, you can see that all of those changes are picked up. Now you can use filters to ignore those changes just for the second. So you can ignore positioning, you can ignore all style attributes like color, uh, font, what have you. And you can ignore uh, any invisible attributes like XPath, um, class uh, changes, ID changes. And if you do that, then you see that the contents of those two uh, websites differ in exactly um, four places. So you have, the, you have two changes uh, in contents, and you obviously um, have changes um, in, the, um, in the illustrations that, that are being shown. And you can do the same thing with the CLI. So if you um, just um, diff the report that um, Recheck produces uh, with the CLI, Oh, uh, no. Um, I'm sorry. It's a live demo. So, right. Um, if you um, div the report file um, on the CLI just like that, then it reports all the differences. And as you can see, these are semantic differences. So it doesn't give you um, just uh, it just it doesn't state there is something different. It tells you exactly what differs, um, but you can ignore as before um, using filters. You can ignore positioning, style attributes, and invisible attributes to come up with the same result. As you can see, um, reporting uh, the same result. So if you would do pixel diffing, which, I mean, there are some approaches, uh, both open source and commercially, um, that you can use for uh, visual regression testing. Um, if you do pixel diffing for those uh, two websites, then obviously what it, what it will give you is it says, look, everything's different. Which is the case. However, um, using um, the, the recheck ignore file or using filters, as you just saw, you can drill down on that. So you can say, where does it differ? So ignore the font, uh, show me where the text differs. Uh, ignore, or do the other way around. If you have, say, um, an English version of a website and a Spanish version of a website, you may want to ignore the content and say, okay, where does the CSS differ? 
So, um, and, and what uh, this also gives you, which we didn't intend when we created it, um, is the possibility um, to do cross-browser or cross-device testing, um, where you can say, okay, I wanna um, generate the Golden Master on a Firefox, and I wanna uh, compare it uh, to the Golden Master on a Chrome, and see where those differ. So, demo you had. Uh, this is just a backup if the demo wouldn't work. <laughs> ah, and what um, also works, is very interesting, um, is it works with animations. So you can't uh, sensibly, if you have moving, um, I didn't open that, if you have uh, moving elements like these, you um, obviously can't do pixel diffing, right? Because they just, they will just keep on moving. So um, it's, it's not possible to, to div them um, um, bitwise in a, in a, in a, or pixel-wise in, in any sensible way. However, um, using recheck, it will report um, that there's um, a difference in, in that text. Ah, sorry. That there's, okay, I can do that live. So we also created a Chrome extension for that, so you can um, <clears throat> just install the Chrome extension and, and create the diffing uh, on the go, on the fly. So I just create the golden master. Then, and the Chrome extension also is open source. Then I compare it. And then the report is created, so I can load the report. And ignoring um, the positioning, because obviously that changes with moving text. Um, it will just uh, report you um, that the animation now starts uh, 0.3 seconds later and um, that there is um, a difference in that text where you can drill down on it and, and see what it actually is. So the other problem that I mentioned earlier with the Golden Master approach is redundancy. So if you um, create like hundreds of Golden Masters, then there will be a natural overlap. Like if you have a website and you create a golden master on the website, and for instance you check the logo, well, guess what? All of your tests will fail. Um, and it um, for other tools, um, we learned that it's cumbersome to um, apply each and every change to all of the golden masters because you have to manually. If you have hundreds of tests, uh, you have to go through hundreds of changes manually and apply each uh, each and every one of them um, by um, individually. And we um, solved that problem uh, with tooling. So if you, um, if you have that problem, um, then you can just say commit, you have to review the changes, obviously. But if you, if you think the changes are fine, um, if you updated your website, if you changed the logo, um, then you can just say um, commit all um, using the, 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 um, um, the CLI that I just showed you. And it will apply all of the changes um, to all of the Golden Masters, or you can um, select them individually, and using the GUI, for instance, um, you can say, um, it doesn't work anymore, sorry. Okay, so you can just say, um, I wanna apply, too slow. So I want to apply that change, um, and I want to apply that change, and I want to ignore that change, and ignore that change. And if you now press apply, um, the golden master is updated, and the ignore file is updated. And um, the same, like here, you, you applied, um, you accepted individual changes, and the same change to the same element is applied to every instance of that change. So if you have 100 golden masters, and you change the logo, it's literally still just one click. Um, and all of the gold masters will be updated. And now, um, what I showed earlier, um, what some of you m might uh, have tipped you off, is um, how did we make um, the test not break when the ID changed? Like, I changed the ID of the test, and it didn't break, remember? How did we do that? Well. Um, <clears throat> we have now um, the comfortable situation that if, like here, we change the ID, um, we still have the golden master 
which is essentially a copy of the website. And in that copy of the website, we still have the old ID. So we can just go to the old version that we have persisted, uh, retrieve the element by the still existing ID, then go to the new version of the website, make a one-on-one -on -one assignment of all the elements um, to, uh, of all the existing elements to all the old elements, and then find the element with the highest match, with the highest overlap, and return that and use that. So what we do here is um, we essentially um, use the, we make intentionally use of the redundancy that's um, created within the golden master. We use the name, we use the class attribute, we use the XM, uh, X path that is there um, to find the element that was intended. And it doesn't only work for, for ID, it works also for name, for, for text, for, uh, for X path, for, for like any attribute that uh, Selenium has. And what it does, oh yeah, um, what it does is um, at, the, at the second we have to do that. So at, this, at the situation where we realize that the um, ID that we are referencing in the test is not in the actual website anymore, then we create um, a warning that we log to the, to the, um, to the log. And we um, now can say, because we make the one-on-one -on -one assignment, we now can identify which old element uh, to which new element uh, was mapped. And then we can say, okay, you need to update your test. And we know which test to update, and we know how to update it. So the next logical step which we want to implement, we haven't implemented it yet, um, but the next logical step that we're working on is to do that automatically for you. So instead of you having to go to your own uh, test code and changing the test code, we can do that for you. Not implemented yet. <laughs> and um, we also can go one step further because um, what we do is when, when we create the, the copy of the website, or what we can do is we can insert an additional um, attribute into the copy of the website that didn't exist or that doesn't exist on the actual website. And then we can reference that additional attribute. And because it doesn't live on the actual website, it's never affected by change. So however you change the website, that attribute won't change. So you have a constant virtual identifier. We call it the retest ID. Um, and essentially it's just a drop-in replacement. So, um, Within the Golden Master, we introduced an additional attribute, and you now can reference that attribute. Um, and again, using the one-on-one -on -one assignment mechanism, it will always find the highest match and use that. Um, and um, so you're independent of, of actual changes. Like, um, if, you're, if, if I don't know, if um, you're not the developer um, and someone else changes the website and the ID changes and your test breaks, um, this can't happen again anymore with that. And also, um, you can use it instead of cumbersome selectors. Like, there's a problem that uh, some elements don't have IDs. Um, then you are, uh, you know, you, you use a fallback of going to the X path or going to, like in that case, um, a very complex CSS selector. And instead of that, you can just use a very um, easy to use um, retest ID that you can yourself define, that you can give a meaningful name, and that is independent of any change. And you don't have to go to another developer that's maintaining that part of the code and say, please, please, please insert an ID for me that I can you know, reference. Instead, you can do it yourself in the copy of the website. So um, the... Um, the support for that, to retrieve that ID, um, I have to admit, is right now not, um, not, not ideal. Um, so because it's XML, you essentially have to, to search uh, the golden master for the element that you wanna, wanna uh, use, and then just use your retest ID. So it's, it's straightforward, but it's not ideal, so we're working on, on how to improve that. Um, but it's uh, a drop-in replacement in your code, so you can just, um, using uh, that, you can just say, okay, I want to use the retest ID, and as you saw earlier, um, it's, a, it's a generated ID. Um, you can adapt it to any value you want, um, but um, if you don't care about it, um, and in that case, uh, we are just using the, the actual ID with a with an, um, counter, um, but you can change it any way you like. In, if you, you just have to also change it within the golden master, 
and then you can reference it. And um, another thing that you can do that some of our customers did um, is you now can create data independent tests. So if you have a situation um, where um, you get um, test data from production into your test system and that changes like every other week um, and you can't create you know, tests for that, meaningful tests for that because you can't assert anything if, if your, your uh, underlying test uh, d d database uh, changes, then you can do that now. So the, the pr approach for that is that you create uh, tests that are data independent so you don't click on a specific, I don't know, um, item or a specific um, uh, name of, of a user. Instead, you click on the first user or on the first item um, and program your tests in that, in that way. And then what you can do is um, you flip out the database, you throw away your golden masters, you um, let the tests run, create the golden masters um, with a new data, and then you exchange your code and let the tests run with the new data, with the new code, and see whether the new code um, behaved any differently than the, the, the previous code, the previous version of the software. So the benefits of ReadCheck, to summarize, um, it gives you rule-based deterministic ignore. So you don't need any, um, like with pixels, you, you, you don't need to ignore parts of the image. You don't need to use AI or any other stuff. It's a, a deterministic ignore of what, you, what you're not interested in. It's open source. You can use it offline. Um, it's, it gives you unbreakable selenium, and in theory, it works for any technical, technical interface. So we um, started off with uh, implementing it for Java for selenium, um, but uh, next thing we do is implementing it for JavaScript, um, and then it can be integrated into, um, say, Cypress or other JavaScript-based testing frameworks. Um, but you could, um, the, the same approach could be used for XML, for JSON, for any technical interface you have, and for any um, data, um, technical data that, that you um, generate, that, that you interface with. And using the same ignore mechanism, for instance, to, to ignore timestamps or ignore, um, I don't know, parts of the data yet that you're not interested in. Um, people like it so far. I mean, it's not that widespread. Um, it's very fresh. What I showed you is like um, 12 weeks old, so it's not exactly um, um, widespread technology yet but we're working on that, and you could help us uh, if you give us a GitHub star, for instance. <laughs> um, as I said, it's open source, um, and the Chrome extension that I showed you is also open source, and you're very much invited to try it and to give us feedback on it. Um, so that's uh, retest, recheck web. <laughs> uh, and um, by the way, I'm, I will post the, the slides afterwards uh, as, as, um, on SlideShare and uh, um, distribute via Twitter. And um, to just explain what we do, um, so um, the Ravi GUI that I showed earlier, part of that um, is, is um, proprietary or part of that is, is a paid solution. So if you want to use the GUI to maintain your tests, this, this will be um, uh, come with a slight um, cost. And if you want to use the cloud to, um, um, to store and retrieve um, both the golden masters and the, um, the um, reports that are generated, um, than this, uh, or if you want to use the cloud to, to you know, collaborate uh, in teams, then this is also something um, that, that we're making money with. Um, and, but if you have an open source project and you want to use this for open source, um, it's free to use for open source. So if you have, like, I don't know, if you're the maintainer of an open source project, you can just go and use that. And uh, the very interesting thing is that this is an enabling technology. So the reason we implemented that is um, not because we, we thought it was so cool, that's just what we learned afterwards. Uh, the reason why we implemented this is we need it for AI-based test generation. So this is where we come from. Uh, we um, implement technology that generates um, AI-based, um, generates tests for your applications, in that case for your website. Um, so if you, th that's right now closed better, so, um, but if you're interested in that, uh, just uh, contact us and we'll be happy to, to uh, yeah, um, keep you posted. So, um, yeah, to wrap up, um, I think you should use that. <laughs> I think <laughs> um, it's uh, probably better. Um, it gives you um, the possibility to um, find differences. Um, it's even, you know, you can even use it for cross-browser testing, cross-device testing, stuff like that. Um, although the original intent was 
to use it for functional um, testing. Um, we, have it, we, we have made an effort to make it easy um, to create and maintain the, the, the ignore files and um, to make that a uh, very powerful approach so that you can easily ignore stuff that you're not interested in. Um, and it helps you create easy, easily create tests and easily maintain the tests. Because um, as I said, what we're working on right now is auto-healing the tests. So once you um, say that you want to apply a change um, with the CLI or with the GUI, you can say that you want to apply that to the code as well, and uh, we will fix the test for you before it breaks. So yeah, um, thank you very much. As I, as I said, please star us on GitHub. <laughs> and uh, here are free uh, stickers if anybody wants some. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Um, what the question was whether we have a separate ignore file per test. Um, this is a pending pull request. <laughs> so we will, it, we will have that with the next release. Um, any other questions? Yeah? Yeah, are the XML of different sites and we see what the differences are that we get? Would this help us? Yes, so we have a proof of concept implementation. So I wouldn't say it's production ready. Um, but we have a proof of concept XML um, um, implementation for XML, and it works uh, just fine. So you can, uh, using uh, the same mecha uh, mechanisms that I showed, you can ignore uh, timestamps, you can ignore data parts of the XML that you're not interested in, and yeah, shouldn't matter. So um, as we said, uh, as I said, we we make a one-on-one -on -one assignment of all the elements, also in the XML. Um, so if the order changes um, of the XML elements, um, it will try to, if, if there's enough context, like if they have enough uh, uh, data to, to, to make that assignment, then it should work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any more, uh, any more questions? Yeah, um, the idea of the CLI is also not working. Um, the Cypress integration. Sorry? Uh, the timeline. Yeah. Um, so um, the, the question was about the timeline for Cypress integration. Um, so we're actively working on that. Um, so um, it's not something that will happen, you know, in half a year. It's something that will happen in the coming weeks or months. So we are working on that. I have no idea how long it will take. So I, I'm not making any prom promises here, um, but we're working on it right right now. Any other questions? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the last part? Okay, so the question was whether how this integrates with pull requests when we update the Golden Masters. Um, the Golden Masters are essentially XML files um, that are stored um, locally, um, so you can just um, commit them. And since it's XML, it works with merging and, and all the you know, standard uh, Git and, and, and uh, workflow mechanisms. Um, and you can, if you um, apply a change uh, to the Golden Masters um, using the CLI, for instance, um, then, as I, as I showed, it will um, apply, if you don't exclude, like if you apply all the changes, it will update um, all the, the Golden Masters according to, to the changes that have been made. Does it answer the question? Yeah, I was just wondering what the, like, the pull request is. Is it you know, one line of change in your code and then 100 examples of that? Mm -hmm, okay. Um, so it, I mean, um, we're working on that. As I said, uh, one of the things um, we offer is storing the, um, the golden masters and the, pull, um, the reports for you. And then in that regard, in that case, um, it would still be one line of change. And uh, um, we're right now thinking about, for instance, the GitHub um, integration, uh, where you would have to um, um, approve the changes, and then um, the, the GitHub, um, the pull request would be only um, possible to, to merge if there are no more differences. Um, but that's not implemented yet, so we're working on that. So it's, as I said, it's, it's still early phase, kind of. Um, so what I showed you is all working, um, but yeah, that is, is uh, uh, something to implement in the future. Um, any more questions? Yeah? Uh, when, uh, so um, 
The, uh, the core part, um, the, the core technology is now implemented in JavaScript um, that, um, that extracts all the data from the website and sends it off to, um, to a Java um, recipient uh, service. Um, and um, having um, extracted that, um, it should now be very easy to, to port that to other languages. Um, the first, um, obviously, the first language we're working on is JavaScript. Have it um, 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 integrated into existing JavaScript frameworks like Cypress. Um, but the next step afterwards uh, would be um, to call the JavaScript from uh, Python, uh, Ruby, and, and stuff like that. So it's it's on the roadmap, but yeah, it takes might, might uh, take a while. So there, yeah. That's a very good question. So um, the question was um, if there's a substantial change to the element. Um, we have an internal threshold that you can set, um, and if the if the um, equal, like if the um, the element is is more different than the threshold allows, then we will not map it. Um, but it's it's kind of a hard problem. Like even for a human, if if you have a website and and you have a button that disappears here and another button that appears here. Um, at one point, is it the same button, and, and at one point, it's not. So it's it's kind of a gray gray area. So it's not a it's a hard problem. And right now, as I said, we solve it with a threshold. So if it's right now, if it's seventy percent uh, overlap of of attributes, then we assume it's the same element still. Um, and if not, uh, then we then we say we don't we don't assign it. But yeah. And that's configurable. Is that right? Yeah, that's configurable. So, any more questions? Um, so the question was whether we can check uh, for an array of objects inside a list. So, um, so what we do right now is um, you check either the the complete website, um, or you give it individual. Um, like if you have an element, a component-based approach, then you can check individual web elements. You can say, I want to, I want to test, um, I don't know, that uh, drop-down list, for instance. Um, and then we would assign, then would would check uh, every element that's contained in the in the drop down list, even if it doesn't display, uh, like if it's if it's not you know uh, if if no one has clicked on it, so it's not opened, um, but but contained in the HTML, um, then we would uh, check for that. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. So essentially, the, web, uh, the question was whether I need to create a golden master uh, for different permutations. And the, the short answer is yes. Um, but you can do that explicitly. So what I showed here is um, an implicit creation. So this, this reject driver creates um, a golden master after every action. So if you say get, if you say uh, send keys, uh, send keys and click, uh, then uh, this results in four golden masters. Um, but you can do so also explicitly. So there's um, um, there's a, an API, a different API, where you just um, use your usual Chrome driver and um, um, use a recheck uh, implementation, and then you can call explicitly um, for the for the um, creation and uh, comparison of the Golden Master. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Um, so in that uh, in that way, you can reduce the amount of Golden Masters that are being created. And um, what you do is here you give it a semantic name, and it will compare uh, to that uh, semantic name. So what you, for instance, if you want to do cross-browser testing, you would create, you would uh, refer to the same name uh, from a different um, test or from a different um, operating system or stuff, and and then you would see the differences to that. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Any uh, any more questions? Okay, so thank you very much uh, for having me, and uh, thanks for attending, and have a good trip, safe trip home. Mm -hmm.